Welcome to today's webinar, uh, Photography Tips for Impactful Vegan Activism. I'm really excited to get into this. Um, but my name is Leah Gage. I am the Program Manager at VegFund. And for those of you who are grantees of VegFund or who have reached out about receiving a grant, you may have communicated with me. Um, I work with all of our grantees and um, other people who want to do programs with us. Um, Veg Fund, for those of you who don't know, we provide grants to vegan activists and plant-based advocates all over the world. Um, if you've received a grant from us, you may know that we have different categories of grants. Um, our community outreach grants are really focused on kind of the um, street outreach and direct outreach that people do, whether it's offering food samples, hosting a film screening, doing pay-per-view street outreach, um, hosting a veg fest. Of course, in today's reality, a lot of that stuff has been paused, and we're really seeing that here at Veg Fund. We're seeing a lot of people just having to pause their activism and, you know, re reshape it. And so there are other ways that you can do activism right now while you can't be out on the street. Um, you could host a learning event, maybe something like this, like a webinar, if you have some expertise. Um, you could host a vegan challenge. Um, get your workplace involved or get, you know, your community to sign up to do a 30 day vegan challenge. We have tons of resources on our website. that can help you get started and really adapt to this new reality. So we'd encourage you to check out our website, vegfund.org. We have a very active blog and we recently posted this awesome blog about all the things that you can do during this world pandemic. Um, in addition to lots of other resources like this one today, this webinar is part of a, a activist learning series that we offer really based on your suggestions and requests and questions. So if you want to post about today's webinar, please do so and use the hashtag VegFundLearn. Um, so here, here's all this information. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom. We really ask that you use that. Or if you can't get your question through that way or can't figure that out, just use Facebook Messenger. Um, if you want to tag us, we are at VegFund on absolutely everything, including Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. So please tag us and use the hashtag VegFundLearn. Um, and without anything else, I think I'd like to introduce uh, today's pre presenter, Joanne. So let me do that. Joanne is an award-winning photojournalist, a sought-after speaker, and the founder of We Animals Media. She has been documenting the plight of animals on all seven continents for almost two decades. She's the author of two books, We Animals in 2014 and Captive in 2017, and was the subject of the very powerful film uh, by Liz Marshall, The Ghosts in Our Machine, which many of you may have seen. Joanne is based in Toronto and travels many months of the year to document and share stories of animals worldwide. And thank you so much for joining us, Joanne. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Uh, thanks for the intro. Thank you for the invite. And here we go. Uh, photography tips for impactful vegan activism. Uh, first, this is where you can find my organization, We Animals Media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, uh, at We Animals across the board. So really simple. And a little about me. Well, you've made a nice intro. So uh, <laughs> very quickly, I've been an activist, an animal rights activist for over 20 years, uh, vegan for 17 years, and uh, a, a photographer for a very long time. Uh, I've been shooting and doing speaking engagements on the subjects of photography and compassion and social change for uh, a long time as well in over 60 countries. Uh, this is an image of me at a duck farm in Nepal. Uh, this is a photo of a photograph. It's a very old photo. And can everyone hear me okay? It's, it's so interesting, like, getting used to talking to a screen when uh, you know there are a bunch of people there, but you're not too sure. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to assume everything's still going well. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you great, I think. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, a, a little bit more background. Uh, in 1998, I was hiking in Ecuador and I came across this monkey and the monkey is chained to this window. And um, this was on a popular hiking trail. And I was standing in a circle of other people around this monkey and they were all laughing and taking pictures 
of this monkey because they thought this was funny. And I stopped to take a picture because I thought this was a terrible treatment of an animal. And maybe I can do something with this image. And I think that's the difference between regular yeah, photo takers and activists and photographers is that we want to do something impactful with our images. And I realized that I was a bit of an island in that situation, photographing the animal uh, so that I could show people an image of cruelty. And I felt that my opinion of what was happening was more important than their opinion. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was back then, so 90, 1998, where the seed for my project, We Animals, which has become the Animals Media, was formed. And I'm sure that some of you, or a lot of you can relate to that, that you're out there trying to take images that impact and change the world. I photograph specifically the invisible animals. Uh, my third book is called Hidden Animals in the Anthropocene, and that's coming out this year. And um, so this has been my focus, invisible animals, hidden animals, um, for almost the duration of my career. And what I mean by invisible animals are animals that we have a very close relationship with and yet fail to see in our lives. Um, we eat them, um, such as uh, the animals in these images. Uh, we wear them. We use medicines that are tested on them. Uh, I guess uh, this warning should have come sooner, but there are some difficult images uh, peppered throughout this presentation. I hope that's okay. Uh, so we have uh, the animals we eat, where uh, we use the medical research. This is at a mon monkey breeding facility. And then there are the animals uh, who are used in religious practice. I'll go past that one uh, quickly. Uh, animals that are used for work, and then animals that are actually hidden in plain view right in front of us. And they are the animals uh, that we use for entertainment. And we see them at zoos, aquaria, rodeos, circuses. Uh, it's really interesting with them because they are right in front of us, uh, but we fail to see them as individuals. They're more there for, for us, for our pleasure. And so they have been my focus for a long time. Uh, why is photography so important to social change? Well, I think we all know this. Um, and that is because seeing is believing. And you can, you know, file all sorts of reports and do all sorts of, of writing and studying but if an image accompany, accompanies what you're saying, it can really grab people in a way that words can't. Images can engage and uh, get people to empathize uh, a lot quicker than, than words can. And so photography is a really, really important, you know this, <laughs> a really important um, part of animal rights activism. And I also wanna give this a little bit more context uh, for all of the work you're doing, whether you're shooting veg pride parades or vegan food photography or animal photojournalism. Images shape history and we see this time and time again. These are three images that are probably known to you. These are images that shaped the course of history. Both historically and today, uh, photographs bring war home. Uh, as recently as a few years ago with the image of Eileen Curdy who washed up on a beach. Uh, that really furthered the conversation about refugees and immigration and, and what's happening. It galvanized people. Uh, we have seen that recently with George Floyd. Um, this is, that was a video that um, created instantly an international dialogue and a very important one. And it was the same thing in 1863 with this image. This is Gordon, he was a runaway slave. And this was the first image of a little uh, sign popping up there. Okay. Um, this was the first image of the physical effects of slavery that was published across the nation in the USA. And it galvanized people and it started a huge conversation um, and eventually helped, you know, was part of the proof of the puzzle that helped end slavery. So to belabor this, images are very, very important to what we are doing. Images are proof, not just of the bad, but of the good. And I know that's what a lot of you are out there photographing uh, in your vegan activism. Uh, images of change and progress and action like this image. So this is Marianne Timé and a lot of her supporters. So she's the founder of the Dutch Party for Animals. And uh, she has done a tremendous amount of good 
in the, in the Netherlands. Her ultimate goal is to ban factory farming in, uh, in her country. Another example of us out on the streets taking good images. Um, and going back to this one, again, I'm going back to this one, like not just showing the negatives, but showing the power uh, that people have, showing the happiness and the joy and the momentum. Uh, that really inspires people, like this one as well. Images show us what is and what should never again be. This is at a fur farm investigation uh, conducted by the SPCA, and this farm was ultimately closed because of the initial work that I did undercover at the farm, uh, which was given to the SPCA, which gave them the material they needed to get a warrant to visit this place. And here you see one of the vets at, um, at the SPCA checking out the mink farm, which led to the seizure of uh, the foxes at that farm. And they were not allowed to practice fur farming again. Uh, so our images, you know, in a way, when you take a photo, that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. That's the beginning of your work. And uh, it certainly is for me. So when I take an image, the purpose is to get it out as far into the world as possible, because images can influence public opinion, of course, uh, but they can be, be used in criminal cases, they can influence moratoriums and help change policies. Uh, working on investigations and film, uh, with films and organizations mean you can get places like these held accountable or even closed. And for example, the mink farm and the, fur, the fox farm that we just saw. And what you're seeing here is another monkey farm where the man is uh, literally showing me his product. That's, that was the, word, the wording that was used. Um, as a result of this investigative work, two of the three farms that we visited in Southeast Asia were closed. Uh, so I want you to think of all of the work that you're doing as historic, because these are images that will be in the history books. Again, the positive images that you're shooting and the negative and the, the sorrowful, sad images. Um, okay. <laughs> um, animal photojournalism. This is very exciting to me. Um, the other day, I googled animal photojournalism, and one of the articles that came up uh, was 50 kinds of photography that you can do in your career. And not one of them was called animal photojournalism. There are other kinds of animal photography. There's animal photography, pet photography, wildlife photography, conservation photography. But these are different from animal photojournalism and animal rights photojournalism. And that's what a lot of us are actually doing. It is a new genre of work that really needs to be pushed out into the world. And that's part of what my team and I at We Animal animals media are doing. Uh, photo, animal photojournalism is uh, newsy, it's more in depth, it is for the animals and uh, not for us. Quite often and historically with animal photography it was for us, it was you know, beautiful images of charismatic megafauna or companion animals that gave us pleasure. And what I'm so excited about with animal photojournalism is that it, it is for animals. It's to help them. It's to generate uh, a conversation. And it's about bearing witness, of course. Um, regarding the suffering of others, uh, there's a, a political activist named Susan Sontag, and she writes a lot about photography and looking at suffering. She has a whole book about it. And what she asks is who should look at suffering? Um, and without getting into the whole book, the answer really is anyone who can help change suffering should look at suffering. And that's all of us, isn't it? That's actually every single one of us in the world, even the hardcore vegans, because we all in some way or another take part in, uh, in animal cruelty. And uh, this is an uphill battle when we're trying to get these images out into the world. It's definitely an uphill battle because people don't want to look at sadness um, because it causes us suffering and it causes us to self-reflect on our complicity in that suffering and we don't often want to make a lot of time for that. Uh, so it is an uphill battle but things are changing. I will loop back to that soon. Um, yeah, so uh, for the most part the general public 
uh, in most countries is not ready to see the world through the lens of animal rights. Uh, tying into what I just said, it is an uphill battle, but that is why we need all of us out there seeing the world through an animal rights lens the way I do and the way that so many of you do. Uh, again, coming back to belaboring this, this thing that like the work that, that we are doing as animal rights activists is very, very important and it's historical and it's very educational. Uh, some of the challenges when trying to get into mainstream publications with the harder images at least, uh, work is seen as subjective instead of objective or misanthropic. Uh, subject matter is unimportant or unimportant compared to other animals or other issues. Uh, media doesn't want to upset its investors and advertisers, and media can be inherently conservative. Um, but these are all challenges that we're overcoming. Things are changing really quickly. As the field of ethology grows, we're understanding a lot more about animal sentience, all animals, not just, you know, not just wild animals, for example. Uh, more than ever, there are, um, uh, media is changing. It's, you know, people aren't just following the New York Times. They're following sentient media and they're following all of these new kinds of media that are cropping up and are less conservative. So it's exciting to be in animal photojournalism right now because there's, there's more and more space for our work. And part of our job is to put a, to identify and speak about the fact that there are billions of animals that we're using every day. Uh, but we can't feel that, can we? A lot of us just uh, cannot comprehend a number like that. And so it's important for us to uh, give a face and sometimes a name, if we can, to the animals in our pictures. Um, I'll loop back to that as well and give examples like this. This is Echo the turkey. Um, so going back here, this was at the Ballarat sale yards in Australia, and there were 32,000 sheep that went through the, the sale yards that day. But then always coming back to the individuals who are in these systems, that's one of my priorities. And we can do that uh, when we're photographing animals and people, like who are the individuals taking part in things? Who are the animals caught in these systems? So this is Echo. Echo was rescued by farm sanctuaries. And that individualizing the masses is really important because then we can connect, be it an animal or non-human animal. Again, so showing numbers. Showing numbers is very important because we want people to understand what an industry looks like. So this is a barn with 2,500 young turkeys. And then here is one individual, this is an upsetting image. Here's one individual uh, in that 2,500. And what we don't know about turkeys is that in confinement like that, they peck at and injure each other quite extensively. And this was not a bird who was in the sick bay. This is not a bird who is going to be extracted from this group um, um, and euthanized or anything. Like this is a bird that's going to slaughter and who will be um, eaten along with all of the others. I promise the presentation isn't all hard. <laughs> we get into we get into um, some of the happier images as well and how to shoot those. Like right now. Um, so this slide, it's equally important to make people smile and connect. Absolutely. Uh, this is Marge. She's at Farm Sanctuary and she was rescued and she came up to the camera and I'm shooting with a wide angle. Uh, one of the questions that came in was what is my favorite lens to shoot with if I only had one lens and that would be my wide. which It's a 17 millimeter to 35 millimeter because my favorite thing as a photojournalist is to get down, get close. You'll hear me repeat that many times in this presentation. So here is lovely Marge. We don't get to meet the animals who are eaten. So it's important to show them. And uh, yeah. And so back to humor and making people smile. This is Prince and that is his head of celery. It's called a head of celery? I can't remember. Um, this is his celery. He ate the whole thing. This was at the Veggie Pride Parade a couple of years ago here in Toronto. And this was at a demonstration um, about cage-free eggs outside of a big grocery store. And so the activists were holding signs about um, what it looks like inside of an egg-laying facility. And then we had these lovely activists in a cage, five to a cage, which as uh, you may know is how many birds are often in a cage at these places. And I love this sign, um, get me the cluck out of here. So they're making a strong point, 
um, but they're keeping it light as well. And that can engage people instead of, of turning them off. So I had to make sure to get a really nice image of, um, of this message and this action. Humor, again. <laughs> so this is Kenny. He lives at Edgar's Mission uh, in Australia, the wonderful sanctuary. And uh, he was also rescued, and I just wanted to include their motto here. It's, it's absolutely beautiful, and I encourage you all to remember it and to use it. Uh, their motto is, if we could live happy and healthy lives without harming others, why wouldn't we? Negative images often have the effect of angering people and paralyzing them. Uh, when we see an image like this, we get really defensive. Uh, that is just the truth. I'm sure you've all seen it. And so I do like to do a bit of hand holding for people when I'm showing negative images. I do like to weave story in and I like to show uh, uh, alternatives. And that helps people process. So here we have um, this capuchin who has been used in medical research and has been rescued. And this is a jungle friend sanctuary in Florida. And, and, you know, here is one of the capuchins just having a lovely time and interacting with others and me. And uh, in our animal advocacy photography, it's really important to show that there are other ways of seeing animals and being with animals. Uh, like this, this is also at Farm Sanctuary. This slideshow is turning out to be the Farm Sanctuary show. <laughs> and, uh, and again, this is Jean, Jean Bauer, uh, the co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. Uh, these two are actually quite similar images. I'll go back. Uh, technically speaking, you will see in my work that I'm often, often using a shallow depth of field. And what that means is that I'm setting my f-stop at 2.8 or f4 because I want the focus of the image to be the focus of the image, like be the subject matter. Um, be the subject matter. That was not well said. <laughs> um, like I want these two and that sweet little kiss to be the focus. And I don't want anyone being distracted by the trees in the background. So you want to drop the focus out of the background. So that's why this is shot at F4. This is probably shot at about F6. I want people to zoom in on that lovely connection between Jean and OP. Uh, Jean was doing investigative work. He was at a factory farm and he found OP still alive at the age of probably four or six feet on a pile of dead animals. And uh, Opie was left there to die, but Jean picked him up and put him into his car and was one of a team of staff who nursed Opie back to health. And uh, Opie had 16 lovely long years. Uh, I love this picture because again, people cannot imagine that you can have this kind of relationship or even this kind of interaction with such a, such a large animal. I mean, often we only see these animals uh, on, on our plates, right? And so uh, it's good to remind people that these are animals that have a face and a name and a personality, and complex personalities, of course. So you've seen some individual standalone images here, and I'm going to show you a few more of those, but I'm going to move into storytelling and, uh, and photo essays. So photos are important, but stories are better. Um, and sometimes you'll get an image like this, and the whole story is in this photograph. You see exactly what's, what's going on. Words are not necessary. There is an individual in the foreground. There's an, in, an un, industrial situation in the background. So for me, this is one of my most successful images, and it has certainly been seen by millions of people at this point because people just connect. Uh, this ties back to what I was saying earlier about get down and get close, wide angle lens. Uh, those are my favorite images. This is a calf who's 20 minutes old. Uh, she's still wet from birth. And this image is quite similar to, uh, to the last image. Uh, there's something in photography called the rule of thirds. Uh, it makes an image more dynamic if the subject matter is not right front not center of the image. So here, this is a rule of thirds. The bottom third is the rabbit, and the top two thirds are of action happening in the background, and that's exactly what's happening here. The image is quite clear. You see a newborn, and then you see where she is being put. Rule of thirds, again. 
Uh, I didn't even mean to <laughs> put those three rule of third images in a row, but here we are. So this is also another image that is quite clear. Uh, the captivity, this darkness of, of the concrete floor and an animal yearning to be out beyond the bars. But sometimes images need a, a little bit of writing and storytelling and uh, the poignant moment brought into the image, not, uh, not through the image itself, it, it needs words. And that's where uh, you can write and storytell and ask a lot of questions when I'm shooting. I'm asking lots and lots of questions because sometimes that's where the, uh, the magic happens. Um, so this is Pepsi, he's at Save the Chimps and he was rescued from research. Um, he's unique not only for those incredible golden eyes but because he has a foot fetish. And um, I was the new girl on the property and he, he had never seen my feet. And so Dr. Noon, uh, who's the founder of Save the Chimps, uh, when he started pointing at my feet and hooting and hollering, she said, oh, just take off your shoes and show them your feet. You know, we do what we can for them around here. Uh, you know, he'd be really happy if she did that. So, okay, fair enough. And uh, I, I think this is so funny about Pepsi because it individualizes him and uh, shows how many funny quirky traits we have in common with other animals. Um, and it's a story that leads to us having more compassion and empathy. With, uh, with an individual. Uh, this is also sort of a regular photo. It's no big deal. It's a dog in a car, but what makes it more interesting is that Abby uh, was at a vet school for the first year of her life. That's where she was born and she was a test study. And um, at the end of their use of her, she was not euthanized. She was actually adopted because this vet school has an adoption program for the dogs that they use. And so what you're seeing here is a dog's first car ride ever. She's just been adopted and she's on her way to her first ever home. Uh, so I keep getting these little pop-ups saying that there are questions. Uh, Leah, what should we do? Should we stop for a few questions or? Uh, um, we going? certainly can. Um, we, you know, we have a lot of questions. There's a few questions here about the emotional toll that taking these photos uh, okay. brings. Pictures, someone asked, I'm an, I'm a photographer, pictures turn me into an activist, but I can't bring myself emotionally to take those impactful images. How do I pass my selfish emotions to take these photos? Hmm. Okay, I will answer that and I'll also come back to it. Uh, in the presentation because it's such an important part of what we're doing. Um, to that question, it is incredibly painful to put yourself in these situations. Uh, I understand that and I acknowledge that and I agree with that. Um, what I stay focused on is not how I'm feeling, but the impact that I can make. I always remember that there are so few photographers who are going to the lengths that some of us go to take images and to document the lives of animals. And we do suffer the price. There is a con consequence to, to doing that. And uh, later on, I'll talk about coping. Um, but I do take heart that when I leave these places safely with the images in my camera, that I'm gonna do as much as I can to get them out into the world, to change hearts and minds. And, um, and that gives me comfort. And then as to actually coping, um, that's something that I've had to learn to, to deal with. Uh, we don't really get taught how to cope. And we should, <laughs> we, that should be like something that we're taught, you know, when we're, when we're young um, for all things and, uh, and self-care, but I'll always talk to that soon. Uh, is there another question I should answer before we keep going? Um, let's keep going and then we'll come to some of these questions uh, a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone. I'm really glad that there are questions coming in. Yeah. Uh, about your photography when you're, when you're photographing anything really, um, one of the keys is to staying longer and looking farther and moving around. Uh, what we are shown, we go out into the world and if, I'm going to turn my phone over, it keeps beeping. Um, we go out into the world and what we can see is right in front of us. And for example, that 
is illustrated by this image here of Luke the Elephant who's performing. I bought a ticket to go to the circus to document. And uh, what I was seeing is what everyone else was seeing, which can only go so far in terms of impactful imagery. And so what I did is I stayed around and I asked questions and um, got access to the back. And this is where Luke is trained up when he's not performing. And this is a much more impactful image. We see, you know, something deeper, something more interesting, something that's more about him. The previous image is a lot more about us and our performances and what we like and what people do. And then this is very much about him. He's chained up, he's swaying back and forth. Um, the zoom is covering the right, for me, is covering the right side of the picture. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but what is there? Yeah. yeah. People can see it? I think so, yeah. Okay. Well, what also makes this interesting for me, this image, is that there are three women with their babies just having a chat, like literally ignoring the elephant in the room. They're just standing there like, how could you possibly not be enthralled by an elephant or concerned by this massive, concerned about this massive animal? And that to me is really telling. And that is where animal photojournalism becomes really interesting, I think, because these are sociological studies. Um, coming back to telling a deeper story, and again, you show up, you get a ticket, you go in, and you're taking the same image that everyone else is taking. So how do you make the image more interesting? Uh, I liked the pointing in this image. I, I think that's interesting. I like that Kiska, uh, the orca, is clearly alone. Uh, but there's so much more to the story. So when I found out about T Kiska and did some research, I found out that she was caught off the coast of Iceland with other orcas in 1979. Guys, she is still there. All of the other orcas died. She has been living alone in this tank. And interestingly, this tank is called the Friendship Cove. And so that's just like the layers get deeper. It gets more grotesque. And as the facts behind her life are illuminated, the image has more weight. So she's been there since 1979. She was impregnated five times, gave birth five times, and all of her babies died. It takes her one minute to circumnavigate this tank. More about the stories behind the stories. Um, we suffer from cognitive dissonance which is the incons inconsistency between our beliefs and our actions. Uh, that is why we treat animals the way we do. And this was at a bullfighting school in Spain. I was working with animal equality. And I thought this was also really interesting. I mean, uh, it's a superficial picture, perhaps, until you hear that I asked the child, why do you want to be a bullfighter when you grow up? And he said, because I love bulls. Interesting, huh? <laughs> Now on to photo essays. Whatever you are shooting, aim for those singularly strong images, but also plot out a photo essay. If you're shooting a veg event, if you're doing food photography, if you're doing investigative work, make yourself a list of the different photos that you want. Uh, you want wide images of the crowd and what's going on. This is a veg fest. Um, this is the number of people. Climb up on something. Get an image from above to show to show numbers. Just like I um, went up in a plane over um, over fur farms in Canada to show the the scope and the size. And then when I'm plotting out a photo essay, it always goes between the big picture to the macro. So here's big picture what's happening, and here are the animals, or here are the people participating. And I'd, I'd like to share a little story with you. And this is a photo essay. Um, how am I doing for time? Oh my goodness. I'm gonna look at that. Oh, you're doing great. We okay. are, yeah, we're at about 40 minutes. Um, yeah. I have, going. I, ha I have 762 slides left. Is that okay? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a story called Rachel's Promise. Uh, I shot this at a uh, sanctuary in Africa. So this is Rachel. And Rachel went to Africa to volunteer for three months. And uh, three months became six months. 
and six months became a year, she was in charge of looking after this, uh, this group of young of juvenile gorillas. And uh, their parents had been slaughtered for bushmeat and the young gorillas, even as young as a week old, had been left to die or had been sold to uh, the pet trade. And uh, this sanctuary, Action Africa, was taking them in and she was raising these babies and bottle feeding them. And after a year, she realized that she did not want to and she couldn't possibly return to her life in England. And so she made a promise to this group of gorillas in particular that she would not rest until she could uh, build them a proper sanctuary home. So you're seeing them in a, a decent enclosure, but it's still nonetheless quite a small enclosure that is too close to the village. And this is the day, this is 10 years later, 10 years after she made the promise to these gorillas. And my trip coincided with the fulfillment of her promise to these gorillas that she would move them to a proper sanctuary space, 200 acres in the forest nearby. And so this is the day before the big move and uh, she's playing with the gorillas who she's raised and who love her and who she loves. And she doesn't know if she's going to be able to have these kind of interactions with them anymore because they might just be so enthralled with the forest that they, uh, which would be wonderful, right? Absolutely. Um, so she's, she's enjoying her time with them. And this is Shay, he's eight years old, uh, definitely too big to be on his mom's back. And how funny that he's holding her boob. <laughs> I get a kick out of that. And so the next morning they had to sedate each gorillas, uh, each of the gorillas one by one in order to move them to the vet clinic. Rachel was a typical worried mama. And here we are in the vet clinic and uh, with the sedated gorillas and they did health checks, teeth checks, vaccinations, and just made sure that they were okay for the big move. And here we are with a Apollinaire and Pekin. Uh, this image went on to be uh, quite award-winning in the world. It's a fairly well-known image now and I think because it's just such a beautiful image of, of hope and it's also so unusual, isn't it? And so Pekin was sedated. She was being moved from the vet clinic to the new enclosure, but she woke up early from sedation. I do not ever get in a car with a gorilla, it's dangerous, don't do it. But I found myself there and I was in the front seat and uh, was nervously taking images knowing that I was getting something interesting. Uh, luckily for me and luckily in general, she was in the arms of her caretaker whom she loves and his name's Apollinaire. And she was very woozy and she looked around and I got this image and then she fell back to sleep again, Apollinaire. And uh, now in the new satellite cage, which is um, the new enclosure down at the 200 acres, all of the gorillas are waking up and Rachel made sure that she was there with them so that they wouldn't be afraid. She spent two days acclimatizing them and then came the moment where she had to, uh, not had to, it was time to open the door and let them out into the forest. Um, it's funny when you're planning a photo essay because in my mind, this was going to be these were going to be the best images. This was, these were going to be like uh, the formative, the best, the best images from the shoot. Like the gorillas are free in 200 acres and look at them go. But in fact, I could not get a good image to save my life. And it turned out that the better images were the ones you've seen already. And so this all happened very quickly. Uh, Rachel comes out and she slides the gate open and like, I can't get in a good position. And I'm like moving around and climbing over things. The gorillas go out and they run off. <laughs> and here is a picture of the gorillas running off to explore their new enclosure. And I'm running after Rachel and Rachel's running after them. And I feel like I've blown the whole thing, but you know, it didn't turn out that way. We have to be flexible as photographers. We have to go in with an open mind and pay attention to the details and pay attention to what's said. Uh, for example, off they went and and here was Rachel, and because I was stopping to take this picture and to frankly document everything that was happening, I was there when she cried and she said, when I took this picture, okay, big man, referring to God, okay, big man, you can take me now, I'll die happy, which was lovely. And uh, she, of course, did not die. She is still there, and she is the executive director of Ape Action Africa, and she has hundreds and hundreds of uh, apes in her care. Uh, On to uh, a pressing question everyone often wants to know. Um, 
how I gain access to places. So let's get into that. Well, first of all, you don't have to really gain access to anywhere <laughs> because animal use is happening everywhere. Uh, animal action and activism is happening everywhere. So, you know, in a sense, it's street photography. If you're going to photograph cube of truth or parades or veg fests or outreach, it's there. So get your butt out there. This is an image uh, in New York City. And this woman was walking down the street with taxidermy. And um, Maddie, if you're watching this, hi. So Maddie and a few other friends, uh, we passed this woman. And I was like, oh my God, did you see that? And luckily I had my camera on me. Always have your camera on you at all times, which of course is different now because everyone has phones on them at all times, which is good. Um, and I kept walking and my friends were like, go back, go back and get a picture. So I got two pictures. And um, yeah, I mean, a deer in the city and how, how awful and interesting. So animal photography is street photography. You can ask permission, go to industries, go to places of animal use and, and ask uh, what I often say is that I'm a photojournalist interesting, interested in food production. People should know where our food comes from. I don't do this though, um, no, no air quotes. People should know where our food comes from and can I come in and do a story? And I ask lots of questions and gain access that way. Uh, that's a great way of, of doing it. Uh, I work with lots of NGOs. I work with uh, investigative units. This was with the SPCA. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I reached out to them and I said, can I go along with your cruelty investigators? And can I do a story on your cruelty investigators? And they said, yes. And so I had access to all sorts of stories. Um, and this, this image is a long story, but uh, I won't get into it. But there was a cat there who was confiscated. And so, yeah, collaboration and working with others is really important here. Uh, I am working with Animal Equality. This is Jose Valle, and uh, this is a case where we were not asking permission. Um, so, you know, for legal reasons, I'm not here to advocate for doing that. I'm explaining that I do it and how I do it. Um, so, as you probably know, a lot of these industries are not open to people like me because they are incredibly cruel and filthy places. And if the public knew how animals are kept, uh, they may not be so uh, willing to part with their money uh, with the products that are uh, produced from these places, products being the animals and their secretions. Um, so I go in at night quite often. Um, we go over fences or through fences and through open doors and uh, document how the animals are living and dying uh, for our use. And then we leave. Uh, one of the questions that came in, which I took note of, <clears throat> was about the legal and safety risks. They are many. This is really unpleasant work for many reasons. And you need to be aware of what the consequences are of the work you're doing when you're doing it. Because you do not want to get into a situation where uh, you, you know, are going to spend a couple months in jail and you didn't know that that was, you know, one of the consequences. So know what you're getting into and it's different from country to country. It's different from state to state as well. So find out what the fines are for trespassing. Um, find out if there are ag gag laws in that state. Find out if you're going to be doing jail time, like what is the worst possible thing that can happen to you that may happen to you. Um, so know know the risks, have, um, have the phone number of a lawyer on your arm. I often do that so that uh, if I am arrested, I have someone to call. Um, safety, your safety is at risk. It is at risk. Um, your emotional safety, your physical safety, your psychological safety. Um, a lot of my investigator friends have been detained or far worse. Some of them have been uh, beaten when they were caught on site or have had their property damaged, cameras smashed, cars smashed. Um, the, the most dangerous thing about these places is other people. It's funny how humans are always the most dangerous. <laughs> and so this is definitely the case for us. Um, so while I do take chances in my work, they are measured chances and they are educated chances. And um, if something seems amiss, I don't stay longer. I don't push 
uh, a situation that uh, seems like it seems like there's going to be a problem. Um, there are also things like um, some farmers will put out leg traps around their farms. They're trying to catch other animals, or frankly, they're trying to injure activists if they've had a number of activists come around to where they are. There was one farm that I went at, went to that there was um, leg traps um, set around the property. Um, all sorts of things. So be very careful. Not that I'm advising you to do it, of course. Here's something interesting. Also, with regards to access, you can buy a ticket to an industry. And, uh, you know, here we have bullfighting and circuses. Now, when I started doing this, I did not want to put a penny of my money into these industries. And so I was doing mental acrobatics, figuring out how I could sneak in or how I could create fake media passes and all of this because I didn't want to give them my $20 or $40. But I had some really good advice. $20 or $40 or $50 is a very good investment into animal rights. And that amount of money will not make or break that industry. They have a lot of money coming in, coming and going. And so you're not really going to be a drop in the bucket financially to that, to that company or that industry. And it's a really good investment. Uh, so I, I do encourage you to buy a ticket and sit in that front row and take the best possible pictures that you can of what's going on and then do the most with those images. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I, I'm talking longer than I mean to. Um, hope that's okay. This is a few, um, these are just a few images of animals in captivity. And what I, what I think is really interesting about going to these places where you can buy a ticket, again, and I've said this before, is you're standing around with all the other people taking, um, taking images, the same images that they're doing. So what can you do differently? And that's actually one of the, the fun challenges about being a photojournalist. You want to shoot something differently. You want to show a poignant moment uh, that captures the eye more than anyone else's pictures there would. And so here I find it really interesting that there is that safety device, that like rescue device floating there next to this lone animal. I mean, for me, this is such a lonely image. And um, yeah, photographing these situations in such a way that do look unique. I mean, for me, this image is of course about the animal, but it's also very much about us and our behaviors towards, towards others. And um, excuse me, I'm trying to photograph the, the loneliness that I see. And I know that you are seeing it too when you go to these places and you want to translate that. You want to translate your opinion of what's happening into, you know, into the images that you're shooting. And so it means moving around a lot. Move your legs, walk, walk, walk. But I'm actually get to that in the next pictures. And, uh, and I mean, this image, how ridiculous, right? This beautiful, this beautiful wild, would be wild animal. Uh, in a parking lot next to an Ikea. It's absurd, isn't it? The stories of animals are the stories of us, and you'll see that in all of my work. It's, of course, about the animals, but it's really making us self-reflect. So I want you to think about that when you're telling the stories of animals. Uh, these things are about how we behave in relation to them. It's about how we keep them incarcerated and what we do to them, because, you know, that's what we want people to, to think about. Um, this is at the Rattlesnake Roundup in Texas, but I'm going to skip ahead because I am, I think I'm going to be going over time. Collaborations are really important. So if you're out there taking good images, um, taking images of animal stories, my suggestion is to work with an NGO who can support, that can support you and can help with the marketing strategy and to get the images up farther. And if you can, work with a media outlet as well. And I will come back to that at the end, but you'll see that photography is not just about taking pictures, but it's about working with the right people and organizations and being at your desk and hustling and getting the images out into the world. Remember earlier I said t the taking of the picture is the first thing. It's like the beginning of the story. It's not the end of the story. And that's what I mean here. So with this image, uh, and all of these, in fact, like all of these zoo images, 
they were in collaboration with the Born Free Foundation. And um, I knew that they had a good platform to use these images and get them out into the world. And then I made a book out of, um, out of these images called Captive. Um, so, you know, it's about thinking strategically, not just about taking good pictures, but thinking strategically and working with uh, good collaborators. So with those collaborators, uh, is there funding to help you get the work done? Uh, do they have a good marketing strategy? Uh, do they have a good vision for what they want to do with the images? Is it realistic? Is it execut executable? Is that a word? Uh, all things that you want to think about even before you start on, a, before you embark on a, on a photo story. Most importantly though, guys, is to show up, <laughs> is to get out there and take a lot of pictures and get out there where there are animal stories happening and practice. And uh, now we're going to go into some techniques on how to take better pictures. And, uh, but I can't emphasize this enough, guys, like you have to just get out there and inconvenience yourself and go farther and push farther and get out there into the world to show up and take those pictures. So some techniques. Uh, before I get into some techniques, um, should I pause? Well, actually, one of the top questions we have right now is about technique and tips for taking good photos. Good arms with low light, but also I think this is relevant to almost any situation, you know, especially indoor events, which a lot of our activists are doing. Yes. Um, how to, yeah, so I think if you can touch on techniques, that'll be really helpful. Okay, maybe some of you guys are wishing I had gotten to that sooner. <laughs> but I love storytelling, so I always, I always start with that. Uh, okay, on to some techniques. This is indoors, there was no natural lighting. And uh, one of you asked about flash, so we will get on uh, to natural versus unnatural lighting. I don't often use a flash. Uh, I don't like flash. I mean, I can use them. I've got one right here, proof, which we'll get into. But um, I'm a big fan of handheld moving around. If I need more light in the camera, I change the ISO. ISO um, um, allows you to change the amount of light coming into the camera. It's a button that we often don't think about or even know about. And in the old days when it, effect, when it affected film, there were always these warnings against uh, not increasing the ISO too high because it would make your images grainy. And with the older digital cameras, it also made your images grainy. But Cameras are a lot smarter these days, and if you invest in even a semi-decent camera, you can move that ISO, which is usually set um, as a default at 200 or 400, which is meant for bright days. Uh, you can bump that up really, really high, and graininess is affected quite minimally. And if you do end up with a grainier image because your ISO is at 1600 or 3200, that's okay. I think that's okay. Uh, this is a grainy image. This is an image that was probably shot at about 3200 because the light was low at this rodeo. And this is all uh, natural light. And by natural light, I mean I'm not adding light. Um, no flash, no strobes, no nothing. So I probably shot this at about 3200. Um, and for me, this is an illustration of moving around and moving your feet. So this is a very unusual image for a rodeo. Uh, I had shot the thing to death. I had been there for days, and I felt like I was photographing the same thing over and over. So the minute you stop seeing good images, you need to move. You need to climb on things. You need to go under things. You need to walk 10 steps. You need to turn 180 degrees, and you will see new things. And I've been doing this a long time, and I still practice that rule. I literally have to tell myself oh my God, I can't see anything else. Like, okay, Joe, move your feet. And that's what happened in this picture. I started walking and all of a sudden these uh, cowboys were up on the rung sitting above me. And I thought it was really interesting that here's this animal that we turn into leather. And he is just being, you know, whacked. He has no autonomy. He is wrapped up in all of these bars and these shoots and this guy has a red shirt 
And then you see these boots that are made of the animal, above the animal. And so because I had moved my feet and I had stayed, um, new situations revealed themselves to me, like this one. And also images can be sociological studies, which is you know, what we animals is. And for me, that's very exciting. This is also an exercise in moving your feet. Sorry, it's like an overexposed image. It's not very good, but it's like a really, really old image uh, shot on film. And so I went down to this thing called Woofstock, and it's a celebration of dogs. And, you know, for the most part, it's really, really good. It's a lot of fun. But they have this thing called the Stupid Dog Trick Contest. And I, had I been down in the crowd, I would have been taking the same old image that everyone else was. So what I did is I actually creeped up onto the stage, and I photographed this guy's stupid dog trick, which is to put his dog's entire head in his mouth, which obviously it's no one would really like like probably this dog didn't really like that and i think it's really interesting that not only did i catch that but i caught the reaction of everyone like we're so we just don't think critically do we and that's so interesting all of these people are laughing because like it's supposed to be funny right it's a stupid dog trick um so i found that interesting so this is another example of move your feet always keep moving around you'll get better images if you if you move around stay longer take time that's another thing um, if you're going to some veg activity or some parade or some anything, you know, if you budgeted two hours, stay four hours. If you're going to somewhere where animals are used, if you budgeted two days, go three days. Because things will reveal themselves to you and different events and different circumstances. I went to this rodeo and I think I was there for about four days. I was honestly losing my mind because it was just so upsetting. But the longer I stayed, the more I saw what I was getting and what I was missing. And it was later on in that shoot that I, I ended up um, in the rodeo and, and the back side of it, in the shoots, that's what these are called. And I ended up getting this image, which is a really, an image of utter dominance, isn't it? With uh, the rope and the fist and the bars. And uh, it's because I stayed that I was able to get better and stronger images. Get down and get close. Uh, I've said this a few times. <laughs> here's an example of getting down and getting close. And here's an example of not doing that. So do not take a picture like this. I don't want to see any of you taking pictures like this. And this goes for animals and it goes for people. So this is a very typical kind of picture that we take from a human vantage eye point. Five foot five, six feet, however tall you are. Like you can tell this is someone standing from too far back. Um, they, I don't think they have a zoom lens. It's great to have zoom lenses. And what could have improved with this image is if they had got down and got close, and they might have got something a little bit more interesting that connects you with the subject matter, like this one. Uh, change your angle, move your feet. Am I belaboring this? Yes, I am. Um, this is at Farm Sanctuary. And because I kept moving around and trying new things, when it was feeding time with the turkeys, I was like, oh, look at this beautiful turkey flower. And this is also a result of staying longer. So stay longer. Uh, lighting. Okay, let's start here. Let's start here. Um, this is side lighting, which is my favorite kind of lighting. And here in this next picture, there is another person who you may recognize, Dr. Jane Goodall, with some side lighting. This is at an indoor event. There is no flash. I also don't use flash because it can be disruptive. It can, it can draw attention to me, and I just really want to you know, fit into things and have no one paying attention to me. And especially with animals, um, flashes will make them look over at you. Flashes will also um, disrupt or stress them out, especially when you're doing an investigation. So I avoid flash. Uh, I love looking for where the window is, which is what happened here. This was like a two hour event and I just kept moving around and circling people. And I had a long lens here, which is how I got this shot. I mean, there's probably two or 300 people here, but I was moving around with a long lens and trying to get this nice shot. And so when Dr. Goodall turned to listen to somebody and she was facing the window, that is when I got uh, that nice lighting on her. And it was the same thing here. Um, one of the lovely sheep at Farm Sanctuary who is facing the, uh, is, you know, the animal is indoors, but is facing the door when I got this. 
Uh, direct sunlight is almost never your friend. Um, I don't know who took this picture, sorry to whoever did, but you're going to get a lot of situations like this when you're photographing at edge events that, that happen outside. And so you're going to have lighting like this in the midday hours. If you can schedule your shoot towards the earlier part of the day or the later part of the day, I would definitely do that. When the sun is high like that, it's going to create shadows, as you can see, uh, in the eyes and under the nose and the lighting is generally unflattering. So you want to avoid direct sunlight. If you have to shoot at noon, go ahead, but try and get people in the shade, which is what you're seeing here. Uh, this is Helen Nelson. She's a badass. I love her. Um, so put people in the shade, and if they're not standing in the shade, you can always ask them. You can say, hey, you know, you look really good. I'd love to take a picture of you. Can you just stand over here? Or can you back up two feet? And honestly, taking that little step will make all the difference for you in terms of getting a, uh, a bad picture and uh, a well-lit picture. So don't be shy to ask people to move around because the picture will just get that much farther, right? And it'll be that much more beautiful and, um, and that's what you want. So don't be afraid to orchestrate things a little bit. Uh, so yeah, when people are in shade, the lighting is a lot more even and you're looking for that. Uh, these images were shot with a long lens, not a wide. Same with the Dr. Goodall image, that was a long lens. And those are really great for portraiture. Um, this is also a long lens. Uh, this is a dark background, which will often serve you well. Like, let's go back. That's kind of a bright lit background, not so good. And here we are. So. Sometimes when I'm trying to take nice portraits, I'm looking for a dark background. And again, I will move my feet around a situation until I see that nice dark background and then see what's happening in front of it. Climb up, crouch low, and uh, frame my image that way. Sometimes you can bring a backdrop. So this was at that Woodstock uh, on a different year where I was actually hired by um, World Animal Protection to show up and take photos of people with their rescued animals, which was lovely. And uh, veg fests are really crowded places and all the, you know, these kinds of events are really crowded. And I thought, oh my gosh, like, how am I going to get nice pictures with the busyness in the background? So I was like, okay, I'm going to orchestrate this a little bit. I'm going to rent a, um, a backdrop. And what you can do is just buy uh, swaths of material and then hang them up with clips on something or buy some stands. And uh, this is natural light. There's no flash. Uh, I set this up in the shade and I had people coming through um, posing with their rescued animals. It was very sweet. And you can do this at VegFest with, uh, you know, people holding signs or all sorts of creative things that you do that you want to, um, you know, use to support animal rights and veganism. Uh, use the weather <laughs> to your advantage. Um, you can do that. There are always creative ways of doing that. Weather, bad weather can be a real stress for you uh, when you're shooting, but um, think of it as a, a positive challenge instead of a problem and uh, do your best to move people around and, you know, even show, okay, well, this was bad weather, but this is what we got. This is actually Liz Marshall who directed uh, The Ghost in Our Machine. Uh, this is also a shallow depth of field. So this was probably shot with my 50 millimeter lens. And it was probably shot at about f2.8 because I didn't want all of those flecks of snow to be in focus. I wanted just her face to be in focus. And so at about f2.8, I may even have been as low as f1.4. Uh, um, creates that really lovely effect. Cropping. Don't be afraid of cropping. Uh, a lot of photographers and photojournalists uh, rightfully so, our purists would be want to show exactly what's going on in a scene, but it doesn't matter so much when you're taking portraits of people and you really want to zoom in on what's going on. And I think that there were some extraneous details in this image. Uh, this is John Stewart and Tracy Stewart at Farm Sanctuary, and there were some extraneous things happening in the picture, so I just cropped in on the sides and on the top to make this a panoramic, and it's a much stronger image. So don't be, don't forget to crop. Backlighting, very tricky. Uh, you have to overexpose an image in order to um, 
execute this well, or if you have a lot of backlight, then you do want to throw in some flash to eliminate the foreground. Because as you know, when you're dealing with backlight, I mean, generally, if you're inexperienced with photography, generally avoid backlight because it's not going to work out. <laughs> but if you want to experiment with it, um, either overexpose your image or add some flash to the foreground because as you know, if you don't, um, the subject matter will be silhouetted. Lighting in complete darkness. I know this, uh, this question has come up with some of you. Uh, okay, so this is not flash. This is in complete darkness. And what I am using is a light panel. Uh, with the back fallen off. <laughs> it's battery powered. It has a dial. So you can see me making it really bright and, and low light. So this is my best friend when I'm shooting in low light. Also because it's mobile, I can be holding my camera with one hand and I can be doing this and doing this. And so that's what you're seeing here. In some cases, I'm with someone who can hold the light. Uh, she was walking, and so we were. All, I was walking backwards, and I was holding the light and pointing it towards her. Uh, that's how I got this. Now, this image, coming back to flash and low light. So, had I been using flash, it really would have alarmed the animals and have caused them to scurry around, um, stress them out. They might have all retreated to the the nest in the background. And so, I was very quiet and very careful, and I took my time, and I took this exact light panel. And I put it on top of the mink cage and I rested it there. So that's why you're seeing in it, uh, lighting from above. And then with my 50 millimeter lens, I put it against the caging because you can see how small the, the cage is, like the, the openings between the cage. Like had I been farther back, I would have been photographing the cage and not the animals beyond it. And I didn't want the focus to be on the cage. I wanted it to be on them. And so the lens was right against there. Um, and so you can't see, that's what happens. You can't see the cage in the foreground. And you can see the cage on the sides, the sides which I wanted. And then I stayed there. And I stayed and I waited for the animals to settle down. This is a mink farm in Canada and the mink kits are uh, huddled up to their dead mother. Uh, here is an example of uh, working with animal equality again, and this is Sharon, and she's, um, she's holding one of these light panels. And so this was a case of me using existing light or available light, um, no flash. Uh, I guess it's kind of funny the wording we use for existing or available light, uh, which is often classified as like, you know, what's coming in through the window or what this guy's doing. But this is also considered available light. She is creating available light for me. And I really liked that this was um, side lit and not lit from me because had I been lighting the situation from where I was standing, it wouldn't be so interesting. Like you, what would be lit would be the side of the sheep. And by the way, these two animals were rescued. This was, uh, this was an open rescue a few years ago. So f-stops, um, this is a shallow depth of field. Uh, this is how you want to shoot portraits unless you really want people to see the detail in the background, with, which often you don't. Uh, this is at a sanctuary uh, called Leilani Sanctuary in, in Hawaii. Uh, this is also a shallow depth of field. Um, this is a lovely man with his rescued cat in South Africa. And uh, so this was also probably shot with um, uh, a 50 millimeter. It may have been my 135. I can't remember exactly how close I was standing to him, uh, but it is considered a por portrait with a dropped, uh, a dropped um, depth of field, which is a shallow depth of field, which is shooting at around 2.8 or f4, uh, so that the background is not there. Because when you drop the background, the foreground comes into focus and you give attention to the subject matter. And so larger depth of field is when you're setting your camera at f11, f16, f22, you want everything to be in focus. And so I wanted the rescued cow's nose and that little fly to be in focus. And I wanted the eyelashes to be in focus. And I wanted the trees in the background to be in focus. Uh, high f-stops also lend themselves really well to bright days. It manages light better when, uh, when you're shooting at f11 or f16. 
Uh, here's another example of that. Um, I think this was shot at around F18. I wanted everything to be in focus because I wanted everything to be part of the story here. And this was at a bull breeding facility. And these are bulls who are raised to be used in bullfighting. And it was a bright day. And so I was out there shooting almost everything at, at F18 because I wanted the facility to be in focus, not just the animals as well. And when you're photographing people and activism, um, again, shoot the big picture, shoot the numbers of people there. That's interesting. It shows context and solidarity and community. But think about a photo essay. So think about that, but also think about uh, highlighting the individuals there. And you guys probably know that, probably goes without saying. But the interesting thing about photography and photographing people is that people will put themselves in the place of the person. Like, oh yeah, I could imagine myself doing that. Um, and uh, this is true with rom-coms. This is true with songs. Like, you know, for example, when you have a heartache, like you think every love song is written for you <laughs> in your heartache. Um, we, we impose ourselves and where we are psychologically into the things that we're listening to and into the things that we're seeing. And so it's really important to show activists and show people speaking up and show their commitment uh, because it, it, it creates solidarity. And it inspires and guides people to, uh, to take part. So this is the Roots and Shoots program with the Jane Goodall Institute. Uh, important to show people with smiles on their faces having a good time at the events. You'll often see me at an event shooting um, on my tippy toes with my camera way above my head, shooting down so that I get a, a vantage point that shows more people. So if I was shooting from typical eye vantage point 5.5, like you wouldn't be able to see as many people. So often think about climbing up on something or shooting uh, way up high. A quick question on photographing events. Uh, yep. so, so we've had a few questions about, from, and this is related to animal photographs or people, but especially mm -hmm. when you're photographing people, what are the rules as far as publishing? Do you keep a photo release form on you? Do you, you know, all those photos you, or all those people you just shared, did you have to talk with each one of them and get their permission to publish mm -hmm. those photos? Uh, it is often on, it, it's often the responsibility of the NGO that I'm working with to take care of that. As photojournalists, we won't get any images if we're spending all of our time asking for release forms. If you wanna be as responsible as possible, you could have someone along with you getting everyone that you photographed to, um, to sign a release form, but it's just not, uh, it's not really feasible and it's not optimal. Often uh, at an event, an NGO, whoever's hosting it should have signs around saying, um, we are taking images, uh, you know, if you're here, you are consenting to be photographed. Uh, so that's something that can be done really easily. Um, it is different. I think you should be more careful when you're photographing children. And often, again, the NGO will have cleared that with, uh, with parents ahead of time. And they may say, okay, well, these three kids, uh, the parents don't want them to be in pictures. So just be aware of that. And um, yeah, I'm sort of, uh, I'm not saying this is good advice, but I mean, we photojournalists, we're often of a philosophy that like, you know, sh just shoot and get the work done and then beg for forgiveness later if need be. For the most part, people aren't, aren't going to be too fussed, um, especially if they're being photographed in a crowd in a positive atmosphere. Uh, and there also is safety in photographing publicly uh, in many places around the world. If you were out in public, you are generally giving your consent to somehow being documented. I mean, think of CCTV, like <laughs> what, what consent is that? Like, we, you know, we are, we are all being documented all the time. Um, if you are, if you take a picture and you see someone notice you or react, uh, I think what you should do, and this is what I do often is go up to the person and say, Hey, like you're doing something interesting. Or I love how, you were holding that sign. I love what you were doing. You looked really interesting. Who are you? Uh, what's up? And uh, so letting them know that you're friendly, that you don't have any malevolent intentions with the images. And so rather than think you might have to delete the image uh, or sneak away with it, just, uh, just interact. 
Do you find that you're often talking to people a lot when you're, you said you're asking lots of questions and we've had some comments about that, that it can be awkward or nerve, you know, nerve wracking to go up to people and ask if you can take their photo. How do you, how do you approach that? Especially when you're, you know, at an event or amongst a lot of people. Well, practice, it's part of the job. And um, you can, you can not do it, but you might risk uh, angering people. I mean, generally at fun events, people are, are okay. Um, you can have a badge on you that says, you know, you're the official photographer so that people know. Uh, you can smile and interact with them and ask them questions. Um, yeah, because people just, just may not know, right? So bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should I keep going or should I field a few more questions? Um, yeah, sure. So there's a question, and you did touch on this, um, about using flash and mm -hmm. when you're taking photographs of animals scaring them and how you how you deal with that and you touched on that do you have experiences where you've learned from you know you did something that maybe scared an animal and then you had to kind of learn to to use your your use your camera and use your lighting differently no I think I knew from the beginning that um flash is I mean because I photograph people and because we know when a flash goes off someone will notice it and look over at it uh, we know what flashes are but animals do not uh, animals are scared of us rightly so um, for many, many reasons. So let's keep scaring them uh, or bringing attention to ourselves to an absolute minimum. Uh, I do remember there was a flash, flash question that came in online and it was uh, someone who was having trouble with their flash with overexposing um, uh, their images. And so if you're using one of these, your best friend on these flashes is the plus and minus button. I mean, if if you're not experienced with a flash and you just want to set it on auto, you go ahead and do that. But if things are overexposed, just dial it down. And it's literally yeah, hitting the minus button and then shoot again and hit that minus button and adjust the, um, the amount of light that is being projected to, uh, to your subject matter. And I would suggest practicing with it as well. So before you, get to an event to photograph it or a speaking engagement and the stakes are higher and you really don't want to mess up practice that makes common sense right and yet we don't often think about it with photography we just kind of show up and okay I'm going to practice now that I'm here but you know take a roommate or a family member and pose them somewhere close to you mid-range far away from you different lenses put your flash on uh, if you're using flash and uh, take a regular, you know, auto flash and then bump it up a few stops and see what the light is like and bump it down a few stops and you'll have a bunch of aha moments and you'll be that much farther ahead for your event work. Mm -hmm. Cool. So um, one question that's been mm -hmm. bumped up is um, when you're in these situations with activists and you're in an undercover situation even, do you ever put your camera down and, and get involved? How do you deal with that? And also even just like at an activist event or a protest, um, how do you bridge the gap between being a participant and being a documenter of it? Well, when I'm at a veg event, I'm participating because right. I'm marching in there. I'm, I'm there to support it. Uh, I don't, I think like just by virtue of being there and, and there with your camera, you are taking part and you are supporting. Um, and you're probably supporting more than other people because you're providing them with good documentation of their event that they can use to, to promote down the road. Um, as to investigative work and uh, participating in an open rescue, for example, uh, I'm there in the capacity of a photographer and that's why they brought me. And often when you're there with your hat, your camera hat, wear that camera hat and, and do that work as best you can because you have a very all window of time to do the best possible job and um, and so I tend to not get involved with what's going on around me and I document what's going on around me I saw that we only have about eight minutes left I need to um, fast track through some of these slides I'm okay. actually I'm actually gonna skip a number of them uh, so that I can answer some more questions uh, do you think that's a good thing to do yeah absolutely yeah, let's keep moving forward. We still have 171 people with us, so they, they're, we're clearly uh, interested in what you have to say, Joe. Oh, great, 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 great. Uh, these next few slides are about how animal rights photography does not exist in a bubble, and it shouldn't. It does and should overlap with um, other issues. So we have labor issues, 
and human rights. We have environmental issues. So these are all things that you can incorporate into your work to make it that much stronger. Um, okay, so coping is a big question for people. Uh, it's almost the number one question that I get asked all the time. So I have listed for you here three books that are fantastic books, um, especially the book here called Aftershock, Confronting Trauma in a Violent World, a guide for activists and their allies. That's written by Patrice Jones. And uh, my copy is absolutely uh, dog-eared. Uh, I've referenced it so many times. So do take note of these three books. Um, uh, invest in a onesie. <laughs> onesies can be really cozy and make you feel better about the world. <laughs> Um, and this is an image by one of our Wheel Media photographers, Julie O'Neill, Nurtured Joy. Now, how do I cope? There, I, I, I cope a number of ways. Um, I know and you know that things are dire for animals, and that's why you're an activist. That's why you're out there in the world taking pictures and doing your best, because you know that things are dire. But just because you know that doesn't mean that you need to live in, in that emotional state. It doesn't help me and I suspect it won't help you if you are draining your energy all the time because you're so sad about what's going on in the world. So we can use those emotions, sadness and anger, um, to, to, you know, in, inject us with the energy that we need to go out and create change in the world. I uh, used to live in that sadness. I was doing too much investigative work and uh, I was eventually diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and I was treated for that. But I had to learn to focus on the best that I can do every single day and um, focus on joy and, and being happy and just mm, not always thinking big picture about how bad things are. And we know how bad things are. <laughs> and, and so what can I do every day? Um, for me, action is catharsis. If I feel paralyzed by the sadness of the world, I try and do something. Even if it's one small, tiny thing, I try and do that and focus on that. And I had to train myself. This isn't something that I was like, la, 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 okay, I'm gonna change everything. I'm gonna focus on joy. I'm a happy person now. No, it's a muscle that you have to exercise to focus on hope, to focus on change and, and good, and to be okay with that. Uh, something that I learned recently uh, about empathy and compassion and us activists we talk about empathy all the time and we need empathy and empathy is a good thing uh, we should continue to talk about it but there is a difference between empathy and compassion and it's that empathy can be really draining when you put yourself in someone else's shoes uh, it can lead to burnout and it can burn out burn you out really quickly and we know that in animal rights the movement is it's a difficult place to be because it's such an uphill battle and there's so much suffering and so if we are empathetic all the time, it, it can be destructive, whereas compassion fuels you. You can feel compassion and it energizes you to activate, to be an activist. And um, I encourage you to read more about that and about mindfulness and um, that kind of philosophy and way of being in the world. So I do study Buddhism, philosophy, and mindfulness, and that, that has also helped me tremendously to um, to cope with the world that I'm in and the work that I do. I'm so glad you mentioned that too, because we just did a webinar with um, Melanie Joy and she talked about that and the need to, for us to, to take time to not always put ourselves in front of horrific images and mm -hmm. to, to be kind to ourselves as activists so that we can continue the work that we're trying to do. Yes, exactly. Um, I'm gonna skip through uh, some of this storytelling because I have too many slides. We'll just get to, uh, to the end here and I'll answer some more questions. Uh, so again, focusing on hope. I do think that the future is getting brighter and I focus on that. Unfortunately, I can't get into the Unbound project, but that is a, a very, very positive project about women at animal advocates worldwide. And these are also examples of portraits and lighting. Uh, this is Carol J. Adams. She's facing a window, so that was on purpose. Uh, I knew I would get good lighting. There's no flash here. Uh, long lens portraiture is what you're seeing here. Natural lighting. Anyway, sorry that I had to skip through all of these wonderful people worldwide. Um, 
it's also really important as photographers and storytellers to to focus on the good again not paralyze people with just the bad but what are the actions happening worldwide to make the world a better place so here you've seen animal rights philosophers sanctuary founders uh, these two women are part of the black mambas uh, so they're part of an anti-poaching unit uh, this is the save movement founder anita Krein animal law and so we photographers can help support all of these other efforts by photographing them which is really really exciting so skipping through i wish i could tell you all these stories but i can't and uh, some of these industries are really difficult to access like puppy mills for example like good luck getting into a puppy mill but there are rescues that happen from ngos so here i was photographing the rescue of 110 dogs from a puppy mill. This was with Humane Society International. So I do uh, recommend to you coming back to collaboration. Um, reach out to NGOs, ask them what they're doing, tell them that you can provide them with good free images um, and do that. You can shoot at shelters. Uh, people don't want to adopt an animal like the one on the left. They're intimidated to adopt an animal who might have psychological problems, but you can take beautiful pictures like the animal on the right and uh, help them get adopted. Uh, be part of the photography world outside of animal rights. Be part of the larger community and that's where you will learn. Um, look at what the masters of photography are doing and study their work and imitate their work and from there you will you will get better uh, so in other words set your bar for photography really really high i don't want your bar to be what your friends are doing in animal rights photography or in event photography and veg photography i want your bar to be like okay what's getting published in national geographic what's getting published in the new york times study that work and and aim for that I gotta skip through. Okay, now, uh, We Animals Media offers a photography masterclass because uh, I get asked all the time uh, how I do what I do, what kind of gear do I use? Um, so all of these things, all of these things. And we wanted to make a resource available to the animal rights community globally about how to do animal photojournalism. And so you can get this through We Animals Media. The website link is down there at the bottom. And there are eight episodes, they're self-guided. Uh, so it's $45, I think. And, and then you can go through the lessons and there are, um, uh, what's it called? Like uh, how-tos at the end and uh, curriculum and things that you can do to work on your animal photography. And so you can check that out. Ah, I'm just gonna skip ahead, except I'm gonna <laughs> get to this. Um, coming back to you know taking pictures is is the first thing you do when you're a photographer uh, keep in mind that being a good photographer is about having a desk job because it's about once you take the picture you need a strategy to get them out you need to hustle you need um, good communications you need to speak about your, your photographs well you need to get them out freely to NGOs so always always keep that in mind editing fundraising emails planning all that stuff. Um, how are we for time? I really need to wrap up, hey? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think you can you can close out and then we have, I mean, we still have people here. So if people want to ask questions, maybe we can stay on a little longer. We're at the hour and a half. But okay. also you've done, your presentation's done a beautiful job of answering a lot of people's questions as we go through. So, so please continue and, and, then we'll, and then we'll end with some questions. Okay, well, to wrap up, uh, in order to help as many animals as possible, I wanted to make all of my work and our contributors free to anyone helping animals. So journalists, and media and NGOs, uh, activists of all kind, kinds. And so we created the We Animals Archive. There's 12,000 photos and video there that you can use for your activism. But also what's really exciting about the archive is that we are bringing on new contributors. So as you continue to improve your animal photography we're going to be accepting more and more photographers and more and more images and so uh, you are absolutely welcome to reach out to us and to let us know that you have some really strong images of something that you would also like to share with the world and we would get those up on the archive and make those available uh, a 
along with all the work that's there already. So that's the archive. And I think I'm going to end on this quote. Um, coming back to compassion and empathy. This is by Andrew Boyd, and I thought this was quite beautiful. Compassion hurts, or rather, as well, empathy hurts. When you feel connected to everything, you also feel responsible for everything, and you cannot turn away. You must grow strong enough to love the world, yet empty enough to sit down at the same table with its worst horrors. And that ties into Buddhist philosophy as well, and mindfulness, uh, to remain empty enough to show up and to bear witness. And that's what we're doing as photographers. We're showing up to the good and to the bad and to the efforts and the stories of change and progress. We're showing up to documents and, um, and to sit at the table with that and to know that it's happening, but to, uh, to create change. And action is catharsis. And I think it's pretty great that any of us with a camera are people who are taking action. So you can feel really, really good about that. As hard as this work is, you can feel really good about the fact that you are contributing in such a significant way. That's it, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, so we did have a bunch of questions from folks who want to learn about becoming a photographer and making mm. their living. Yeah. And you touched on a lot of what goes into that. And also, I think maybe your masterclass would be of interest to uh, budding photographers who are mm -hmm. kind of getting their start. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that at all? Yes, I'd love to. So first of all, hustle. You don't become a photographer by taking good pictures. You, you become a photographer by uh, hustling and learning all the time and being an entrepreneur and creating partnerships and collaborations. Uh, I don't think you can also, you can accept, expect, sorry, to make a living as an animal photojournalist right away. Uh, I, you know, certainly couldn't. And I had to, and wanted to, uh, be a photographer in my own right, um, making money to pay for the documentary work. And as I built a reputation in the documentary world, there was more funding coming in to that. And so it takes time. Uh, you can certainly start a Patreon uh, once you've built an audience and built a bit of a reputation. I wouldn't jump the gun too quickly on starting crowdfunding for yourself if you don't have a, the start of a reputation yet as someone who's doing good work for animals. And so you have to hustle. You have to practice a lot. You have to shoot a lot. And in the meantime, do the other work. Like, do the work that pays for the stuff that you want to do. I had to do that for a long time. You know, whether it's a serving job, or a desk job, or like it was for me, I was doing food photography, wedding photography, event photography. Do that and, and hustle. Make connections, talk to a lot of people. Uh, part of how I got so ahead in animal advocacy photojournalism is that I called everyone. I called every NGO and I was like, I like what you're doing, can I document it? I can do it for free. And I did that for a long time on my own dime until NGOs started saying, hey, can we hire you to go out and shoot something? Or maybe they couldn't hire me, but they could pay for a flight and pay for Airbnbs and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so don't expect things to move really quickly and work really, really hard and form collaborations. Excellent. Um, for those of us who maybe you know want to take great photos but aren't aspiring to be professional photographers, um, do you, someone asked, should we invest in a good camera or will good cell phone cameras work? Um, yeah. I think most activists, you know, they're taking, when we ask for people to submit photos, they're using their phones. Do you have like any quick tips on using, using or, or a good cell phone photo that you, or a good cell phone, you know, camera that you think works well? I don't because I am not skilled in camera photography. Uh, and probably a lot of you are way more skilled than I am with, uh, not camera photography, phone photography. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly the things that I've talked about, about exposure uh, can, you know, can be worked on and, and zooming and all that, like you need to, you need to practice those things. But I think that a course on phone photography would be for someone else to deliver. And I know there are a lot of you out there who are really, really good at it. Um, and you, you can invest in 
a good camera and it doesn't even have to be that good. Like if you want to uh, buy something used with a zoom lens, that's a great way to start. So buy something used and not something high end. People often make the mistake. They're like, I want to be a photographer. So I need all the gear. You don't need the gear. Start humble, get something cheap, get something used and start with a lens that maybe is a zoom like at 24 mil to 85 mil or something like that, which gives you a little bit of range for both wide angle and portraiture and zoom. So start with that and practice and don't upgrade until it's warranted. Um, and until you're taking better pictures and you're like, ah, okay, well, my skills are now exceeding the capacity of this camera. And so at that point, uh, I would say, you know, invest more money in, mm -hmm. uh, in a camera. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you've, you've taken so much time to put this together and we really appreciate it. Um, we, you know, I think a lot of questions about lenses and about technical issues can probably, if, you know, if people want to take your master class, I think that's probably going to be a great place mm -hmm. for people to learn more about, about that. Um, would you be willing to uh, share your presentation with us so that we could publish this uh, with some of the notes that you have about exposure mm -hmm. and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. My okay. pleasure. Um, also, before I forget, um, while we still have some of you here, I'm going to ask my colleague Fabiola to put in the chat box a survey. It's just a quick two minute survey that we use to find out what you thought of today's webinar, whether you thought it was helpful, if, uh, if it was too advanced, if you needed uh, more information. Um, it's a quick survey and it really, we trust us, we really look at these surveys and we, you know, we're interested as I'm sure Joe is um, in, in how it went so that we can improve and, and do better next time or, and also offer, you know, more topics that you're interested. So yeah, looks like Fabiola just put it in the chat. Um, it's a, it's a type form and it's, it's really short and we'd appreciate your time. Uh, there was there was one other question someone had asked about yeah. a favorite lens, and I did want to answer that oh, great. Uh, because it could be useful to you. Uh, my favorite lens is a 17 to 35, which is a wide angle. Um, and so you might be wondering, well, why is she recommending that when she's also talking so much about portrait photography? And um, with a wide angle, you can get closer and zoom in and get those close up pictures, but you can't do the opposite with a long with a, like a, a really long lens. And so ideally, I like a 17 to 35, something wide, so I can capture big picture stuff and so that I can go back to that basic tenet of get close to subject matter. And so if I wanted to get a portrait with a wide angle, I can go up to a person and set it at 35 and still get that portrait. So if you're wondering what lens to get for your activism photography, I would definitely start with something like that. Excellent. Great. Um, well, we, you know, we're at about, a, we're, we've gone about 10 minutes over and I don't want to take too much more of your time, Joe. Um, this oh, I, I'm happy to answer more questions if you like. Okay. Um, it's, I'm getting also some comments that maybe people aren't able to see the chat. So we're going to make sure that we get that sent out to, to folks. Um, one question we got, as you've become better known, do you find it more difficult to go into places and, and ask for permission to to take photos, especially in factory farming settings? No, I mean, there's, <laughs> the world is a big place and there are so many places we can go. I mean, as I get more well known, it's, there's a chance that someone might know who I am, but more to the point, I think that activism is getting more well known. Animal rights activism mm -hmm. is, is a lot more known in the world than when I started uh, on this journey. And so we, industries are aware of us, <laughs> not just me, but of us. And um, I think that when we're gaining access, I, I think it's important to be authentic in our approach as people who are curious about what's going on and curious about why people do the things we do um, and be as truthful as possible. I mean, it is truthful when I go to a farm and say, I'm a photojournalist and I want to photograph, you know, uh, farm to table stories. And that I think people need to know where the food comes from. It's important. Often people will agree with me and say, yeah, we also you know, want people to know where the food comes from. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is a changing landscape with photography. Um, you're going to get a lot more no's to your request than you would have a few years ago. But that is why we're going to have to keep evolving 
and why we're also going to have to fight for access to these kinds of places so that they are not hidden industries that we can't access. We're going to have to fight ad gag laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, this is a multi-pronged thing, uh, big picture, not just about like, oh, how am I going to gain access? And we're always going to find ways to gain access. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you keep looking, you'll get it. Well, and I appreciate your point about partnering with other organizations. I think sometimes we as activists can feel very isolated and, you know, as you said, just make a million phone calls, you know, you know, use your time to reach out to people and eventually you'll make a connection and maybe can work together on something, whether it's an event or going and taking photos. Yeah. And NGOs will often say yes, because they need good photography um, to show what they're doing, whether they're using it as, in a criminal investigation or whether they're using it to promote their, their fantastic efforts. Um, somebody asked, what camera do you use? I don't know if you've shared that yet. Oh, uh, I use Nikons. I use uh, older, non, not mirrorless. Why am I hesitating on this question? Because I don't want anyone to think like, oh, I need those cameras. So okay. I, <laughs> I use a Nikon D4S and I use a Nikon D850. Uh, and actually, you can see one of them in this, this picture with this um, sweet little baby uh -huh. climbing all over it. Um, yeah, it's not so important, really. I mean, all, a lot of the brands are fantastic. Mirrorless are great because they're really light. Um, however, I like to be changing lenses between my cameras all the time, and you can't do that in a factory farm with a mirrorless camera because um, it will get really dirty on the inside and ruin the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and my cameras are really heavy. So I don't actually recommend you go out and get a D4S. That's a really heavy camera. I love it. I'm used to it. It takes stunning, uh, stunningly technical mm -hmm. images. But uh, I think that you should focus on, um, on like the subject matter and, and developing your eye before you worry about uh, uh, getting a, a high-end camera. Somebody asked, um, how do you balance between positive images and painful images um, in publishing and, and showing the truth of what, what's going on? Okay, well, it, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, it depends if you're talking about social media and what people are expecting from us. Like with We Animals, people are on Instagram and Facebook, they're expecting um, to see images of uh, truthful situations being exposed and uh, unfolded and... Um, images of industry and that kind of thing but when i'm storytelling like when i'm doing speaking at a conference uh it's a roller coaster of the good and the bad because i want to create a narrative and a story and i want to bring people from feeling a certain thing to feeling hope and then feeling something reacting to something poignant and so it all depends but if you are you know you're with a small group of people or you have a small audience i would really consider strongly balancing a lot of good with the bad or maybe it's not the good but it's solution focused so here's the problem but here is what you can do um i'm not like banging people over the head with it i, I think sometimes we make the mistake of just like shouting at people go vegan and i mean we should go vegan i want the world to be vegan as well but uh, a nuanced approach is always good meet and uh, meet your audience where they're at so if you can show them something difficult well like, here's a solution, or here's what happened, here's what can happen to these animals. They can end up in sanctuary. You can visit a sanctuary. Um, all of this messaging is really important. But um, if you see anyone that you're talking with or writing to, sinking into, or responding with some kind of negativity or paralysis, uh, it's, good to, it's good to offer a solution. Just needed. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We need we need to see both. Um, well, I'm looking through most of the questions and I think, um, you know, a lot of these questions are you've touched on about uh, lenses, your camera, um, asking for permission um, and getting into photography. You said that you you would ac accept some, you know, if people wanted to reach out to you and show you their photos and maybe consider adding them to the archive, you'd be interested mm -hmm. in receiving? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a lot on the go right now. We're putting out a book called Hidden and uh, that's 
uh, pretty consuming right now. Yeah. I should mention that, you know, you, the last question was about the bad with the good. Yeah. We're putting out a book, which is a documentation of the horrors that we inflict on animals because we want to give this a physical home of like, look, look at what we do. Um, images, when you put them in a book, it gives it more weight, literally, than having things flash by on social media. Um, but I am getting off topic. So that answers that gives more context to that last question. But yes, I remember now. Um, so submitting images. So we're really, we're really busy with that and a few other things. It takes us a while to get back to you, but we will get back to you. And um, absolutely send an email. Um, you, you put in the subject line, like uh, contributing to the archive. And next year, we're going to be launching our portfolio review program. And I'm really excited about this because part of what I do now is not just the field work, but it's also mentoring people to take better images. So this is like really quick overview of all of that. But what I aim to do is to get in deep with some of you who are taking good images and go through your portfolios and take it apart and, and talk about what's working and what's not and, and why so that you can all become better photographers. So that's something we launch next year and we'll be launching a fellowship as well. Uh, which is a way of financially supporting people in their animal rights, photojournalism, and filmmaking they, uh, that they want to do. So lots going on with We Animals Media. So definitely follow along and take part as much as you can. Uh, when should we expect Hidden to come out? Do you know yet? Hidden goes to print September 7th. And wow. uh, assuming all goes well with COVID and well, nothing's going well with COVID, so let me reframe that. Um, the goal is to have the book in people's hands by the end of the year. And there may be a few delays, but hopefully not. So this is a 320-page book, and there are, I think, 38 contributors now. And these are animal photojournalists who are doing incredible work to expose uh, our relationship with animals. So uh, I'm really excited about this book. It's not just... Um, my book, my work, it's the work of many of us. And uh, you can buy the book on Indiegogo, which is way, where we are uh, selling and promoting it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a really valuable presentation. We learned a lot about, you know, taking photographs of animals, taking photographs in general. Um, and you have such a wealth of experience and we just really appreciate it, especially for the you know, young and up and coming photographers on today's call. I think there's a lot of interest. Um, and we just appreciate your time because you My are pleasure. so busy and you're putting out this book, which we're excited to see. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I, I sure hope it was helpful to some of you and, um, and do reach out. Like I said, sometimes it takes a while to get back, but uh, do reach out. And the master class will also answer a lot of uh, other questions that you might have if you're interested in uh, continuing to, to build on your animal advocacy photography. Awesome. Well, um, again, I'll just make a plea to those of you still here to please fill out our quick survey just so we can get your feedback and find out um, what you thought of today's webinar. Uh, the presentation has been recorded, and so as soon as we have it edited, we'll, we'll take a quick peek and make sure there aren't any uh, weirdnesses, and then we will sh we'll, um, put that up. If you've registered for today's webinar, you will get an email for uh, email letting you know that uh, recording is available. And then if you want to share it with others, they'll just need to register and sign up, and then they'll have access to that video as well. Um, so please stay in touch with VegFund. We offer things like this all the time. Um, we're always interested in knowing more about what it is you want to learn about. So please um, don't hesitate to reach out and uh, let us know what you thought of today's presentation. And um, if you find yourself inspired by today's presentation and want to apply for a grant, we certainly encourage you to do that as well at VegFund.org. So thank you again, Joanne. It's been lovely to speak with you and we appreciate your time. Thank you uh, to you and to everyone who attended. I really appreciate it. It was great to see so many people interested in animal photojournalism. So thanks yeah, so much. I agree. Take care. Have a good rest of everyone's day. Bye-bye. <laughs>